Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We're so happy to be here and talk about this important topic. As it was mentioned earlier that this is a complex topic, it's a heavy topic, but we all have a vested interest in this topic. Uh, so tonight, Joan and I, we're gonna talk about understanding the ripple effects and how we can all get involved to prevent sexual violence. I'm Tracy Cox, and I'm from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, and I'm, Joan, and I'm joined tonight by... I'm Joan Tabachnik, and I'm from DSM Consulting, and also I could say that I'm um, like too close. And I'm also um, doing a, a fellowship actually with the Department of Justice, I need to say that, James, um, the SMART office. So I actually have a fellowship in sexual violence prevention, which to me is a very encouraging moment because they are investing in sexual violence prevention. Um, I'm also very excited that so many people here stayed um, for the whole time, so thank you. We weren't quite sure how many people would be here. And, um, and also to say that, that um, we're, we're excited, but this is actually the positive part that we're gonna, we're gonna be attacking tonight. Yeah, so to um, just build upon what was already discussed earlier, um, each of us does have a role to play, and each of us can be part of that solution. So tonight when you leave here, there are a couple objectives that we want to cover. So when you leave, you'll be able to answer not only what you can do as an individually, individual, but like as what we can do collectively. Right, so just maybe just building a little bit on what we've already talked about tonight. So um, our first speakers talked a little bit about how sexual violence is, um, is a public health issue, which means that it's not inevitable, it's actually preventable. And that's a very hopeful message that most of society is not hearing. Uh, second, that um, the, sa the safest sex offender is someone who's stable, who's someone who's em employed, um, has a family to support, um, and somebody to hold them accountable. And What's ironic about that is that a known offender is actually the one who's a safer offender. And, um, but it also speaks to the importance that all of us have a role in helping to hold them accountable. And um, that's something that we need to take, take, get, get involved in. Which I think segues so well to the next message, which is that um, managing sex offenders in the community is a very complex uh, concept. Um, and that collaboration is key, which again means that it takes all of us to be involved. And last, what we'll be talking about tonight is that there are practical, everyday, everyday um, actions that you can do, that we can do, um, to prevent sexual violence. Indeed. Um, so how many news junkies are in the room tonight? Anybody, like, addicted to news? Um, great, I'm not alone. Um, as a former journalist, uh, I, I call myself a news junkie, and it doesn't take long to just scan the headlines online, or you pick up the paper, or you turn on the TV, and you see that this topic is everywhere. Um, as depicted on this slide, um, it's on the national radar. Uh, just earlier this year, the White House unveiled several initiatives to combat sexual violence. Uh, most recently, last month in September, they unleashed um, a new campaign geared at curbing and preventing sexual violence on campus. So we are definitely at a tipping point. So how do we take these stories that we see in the news every day, happening on a, on a large, high-profile national um, on stage and talk about them in our daily lives with the people that we love and really apply the local voice to that. Um, one way is uh, through the work of the NSVRC, we engage media and journalists and we try to help them see that this is a very complex topic and, and that, that was talked about earlier tonight that it's not easy. So we want them to be um, knowledgeable and be able to report on this accurately. Because as a journalist, I know that there are several um, old school uh, reporters and everything, uh, especially in TV news, that have that mantra, if it bleeds, it leads. And unfortunately, in those stories, the TV news and, and, the, and stuff that you see, it's usually the most horrific, um, the horrible, worst case crimes. And that was mentioned earlier, a lot of the stranger danger stuff that we think is happening all over, it's not the case. In the majority of cases, the victim knows the person who's sexually abusing them. So it's helping train the media and helping them see that um, there are victims, there is prevention, giving them a greater context to this issue. Um, and one way that we did that was with the Jerry Sandusky case a couple years ago out of Penn State University. We worked with ATSA on a letters to the editor campaign. And it was wildly popular because what we did is we set up some letters, sample letters, and we allowed people to download them and they could either submit them to their local papers 
Or they could use that as a spark, a starting point, and they could write their own localized letter to the editor to get this conversation started. Because this isn't an issue that just happens at Penn State. It isn't an issue that just happens in the military. It isn't an issue that just happens on college campuses. Um, everyone here probably is able to talk about a story that happens within their local communities at their schools. So we wanted that to, to start that discussion, to let people know that it's happening everywhere and that prevention is possible. So these are just some high-profile cases and events that's happened within the last couple of years. So the fact the media is talking about it, um, but there, um, if you think about sort of the image that people have when you say sex offender, um, there's actually a term now called, um, that I've just heard recently called a visual hammer. So when you say sex offender, the visual image that we all have is very, very powerful. I'm, I know for me, um, when I, the age that I grew up in, it was, you know, it was the uh, dirty old man in a trench coat lurking on the edge of the playground. I mean, that's a very vivid image. I asked my niece recently when I say sex offender, and yes, we do talk about it in our family. Um, she's she's uh, uh, in high school and said, like, well, you know, when I say sex offender, what do you, who do you think of? Or what do you think of? What's the image? She would see things like an overweight, over, overweight man sitting in his mom's basement lurking on the internet. So we have these images, they're very powerful images. Um, and, um, and then also you think about the words. I also do an exercise, I ask people when I say the, you know, the word sex offender, you know, what, do you, what words come to mind? And you know, people come up with, you know, start off saying you know, maybe you know, a guy you know, lurking, but then they'll start come up with, you know, they'll come up with like creep, you know, creep, sicko, pervert, you know, it gets worse and worse. And if you ask what feeling words come up, you know, the feeling words are anger, fury, resentment. Um, so this is when we say the word sex offender, that's what people are imagining. That's the pushback. Um, so, and that stereotype is getting reinforced um, by the, what, what Tracy was just saying in terms of bleeds it leads. And um, one of the things that sort of I think about, like, what if we began to replace that, that, that visual image with more something more like this? Given all the statistics that we were talking about, this happens with someone we know, someone in our family, um, that if we're talking about thinking about how do you have that conversation, if you're thinking about you know, the dirty old man looking on the edge of the playground, it's really hard to think about how am I going to talk to him. But if this is the image that we have, how would you have that conversation, maybe like with a little boy in the blue shirt in the front? So you may want to start to say, like, you know, that, you know, talk that you know, in the usual conversations you might hear in school that no one has the right to touch you. You might also begin to say, and you know, remember, and you actually don't have the right to touch someone else. Begin that conversation at a very early age. And, um, and think about these are images and conversations that we can have. Um, that with each other, and that leads to a whole different sort of uh, point of action. So, oh, sorry. Um, oh, go for it. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, so basically, that um, there's sort of a growing um, interest, I think, in what's called bystander intervention, particularly in college campuses. Um, and there's a brochure that the NSVRC put out that um, that I, I authored that's out in the back that's for free. And partly, if you think about bystander intervention, is really about how do we how do we learn how to talk about it, and if. So child sexual abuse and sexual violence in general thrives in isolation and thrives in silence. It's an amazing thing that we can do T today. When we leave here today, we can go out and start talking about it. We've used this strategy in lots of other public health campaigns. You think about mad mothers against drunk driving. We've done that in terms of making sure that friends don't like friends drive drunk. We've asked for a bystander to get involved. Um, we made it very specific. You either take away their keys or offer them a ride. Um, in New York City after 9-11, um, there's a lot around security. If you see something, say something. We could use that slogan. We could use that for, for our work as well. It's a very complex issue, and there's no one right answer. Um, and there are many things, but there are many options, and there are many people who can respond over time. And we'll get back to that point in just a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what Joan said, one component of being an engaged bystander, or as we talked about it, bystander intervention, is just talking about it. Uh, several people talked about that tonight and touching on that, that we hope that when you leave here, that's not the end. That you go and you think about what was discussed tonight, you take some of the information that's on the back table, and you know you talk it over with your inner circle, with your family, with your kids. Um, if someone asks you at work tomorrow, hey, what did you do last night? You can tell them. Um, just opening that dialogue up. Uh, and also, uh, it was mentioned earlier, too, about uh, having age-appropriate, ongoing conversations with your family and your children about 
healthy sexual development and boundaries and what that looks like. Um, for the past three years, the NSVRC has focused on that specific topic through our efforts for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So on our website, there's a wealth of information there as well. So yeah, just being askable, that's the most important thing, talking about it. Because if people see that you are askable, they'll come to you, you can talk with them, you create that open dialogue. And then also too, if you're feeling uncomfortable by situations or you sense that there may be some red flags, bring that up and chances are perhaps you're not the only one that feels that way. So having those conversations, you can get to, to the core of this. Maybe, maybe one, one thing actually that I think would um, br br brings that home to me very um, sort of is um, an offender that I was speaking to once who, who talked about how he always admired the courage of his daughter who he had sexually abused because she actually had the courage to say the words when no one else would. And he talked about, he said, I'm not blaming his family, but he always wondered that if his family was able to talk about it in the first place, would, and he wouldn't have to say the words first, would have been easier for him to, to actually disclose what was going on, and certainly would have made it easier for her daughter, for his daughter. So I think it's very important is that, that concept of actually saying the words and being the first ones to say the words and being comfortable, so that if someone does disclose abuse, that you're comfortable with, that, with those words, and you actually know what to do as well. So um, one exercise that we find really helpful to do, and, and I think if, um, it's hard to do in this large room, so we're gonna actually um, so sort of run through it you know, between the two of us. But just to just give you a scenario, and then just how, it, if you actually drill down into it to any situation, and you can do that really with any situation, um, you, can, you can really unveil lots of different um, opportunities. So in a scenario here, Sam and Emily decide to head out to a football game at their high school. At first, they were having a great time, but then some guys behind them started to make some comments. At first, it wasn't too bad, then it started to escalate. And Sam and Emily tried to ignore them, um, but the guys became ruder. Um, the guys were saying things like, come sit with us, baby, you know, come sit on my lap, and it got more and more um, just graphic after that. So Sam and Emily told them to stop, but it just seemed to encourage them more. So this, this is something, think about this being, you know, experience that you may have had, experience that your, your, your daughter or someone you know or sister, um, what would you do? What would you suggest that they do? So we just thought that we could just really unpack this a little bit for you. Um, and it's something, again, which is great to do if you ever work in a workshop to actually take any situation, you all probably can name hundreds of them, what would you do in that situation? So I think we'll start with you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you start to see the ripple effects that no one is an island. So in this case, some individual things that we talked about, for instance, Sam and Emily, they could um, tell the people that are harassing them, hey, look, stop, and if you don't do it, I'm gonna report you. Um, also, too, there are other people around them, so perhaps there's a row of fans in front of them that they could just tap on the shoulder and say, hey, do you mind if we switch seats? Um, so just going, so just expanding the, the ripples out a little bit further. Um, so what about the friends of the, the, the guys who are harassing? Um, they could say, hey, this is really not okay. Um, um, this is not funny anymore. Um, they, could, they could actually go and sit down um, with Sam and Emily and say, you know, this is a, a no harassment zone. Um, they, could switch, they, could, they could find someone to help switch seats with them. Um, or they could sort of reach out, maybe um, you know, call some other friends outside or call security, uh, depending on what kind of situation um, or administration um, that they have there. And then chances are, if it's a school event, there's probably going to be other teachers there, coaches, parents, possibly school administrators, too, that are hearing this as well, and they could intercede. Um, Sam and Emily could actually go, maybe act like they're going to get a drink at the concession stand, alert security, security could come back, and they could tell the people that are harassing them, listen, this isn't the place for that, uh, we're not going to tolerate it, and ask them to leave. And then as a follow-up, uh, bring it to school that next Monday and have like the teachers address the situation with the harassing students, have the principal reprimand those kids, and just letting them know that you know the school and the school property is not the place for this. And I think that's, that's actually a place where a lot of people get stuck. Um, what they find is they think about just that particular moment, what could I have done, and I wish I had done, as opposed to, um, and maybe because I live in a small town, and if you don't do something in one day, you're gonna see them at the supermarket. If it's not the supermarket, you'll see it at your kid's soccer game. Um, that Monday is sometimes actually the better, more teachable moment. And it allows you to actually to not just talk to those two kids, but everybody else in that, on that stadium saw what was going on. So it becomes a teachable moment for that entire school. And you begin to ask questions, is there a school policy? Is there a code of conduct? Is there something that can be done within that institution to help make sure, and as people was talking about earlier, to create that social norm? 
So then we're talking about where do we begin? Um, we mentioned earlier being askable, talking about this, but not only talking about it, but listening too. If you are askable, people are gonna come to you and they're gonna bring this up and talk to you. So just listening to them, listening to not only um, the verbal comments, but the nonverbal cues. Like for instance, um, say you're at work and you notice a coworker really sexually harassing an intern, saying wildly, rudely inappropriate things to them. The intern is very uncomfortable about it. You're uncomfortable about it. But you know the intern might feel afraid to speak up, so they don't. So you are in the position where you could actually say something. And you could either talk to your coworker and say, listen, that's not acceptable. Or you could talk to their supervisor, talk to someone in human resources. So it's just seeing these um, daily things unfold and intercepting them before additional problematic behaviors occur. I think it's the next one too. So then to help you through all of that, um, we talked earlier about learning about healthy sexual development. Like I mentioned, uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center has a wealth of information on our website, and it's free, it's downloadable. We also house the um, nation's largest library regarding sexual violence and prevention. So I, I invite you to check out our website at www.nsvrc.org. Um, in addition to the healthy sexuality materials that I mentioned that are online, uh, we also have some materials on the back table. Uh, Joan mentioned that she did a book a couple years ago on bystander intervention. And in that, there are scenarios and responses, as well as last fall, we um, released an information packet. And part of that information packet contains a bulletin. And in that bulletin, there are real life scenarios, just like the one we talked about with your coworker, um, and then Sam and, Sam and Emily, and um, it gives you practical responses. Um, so there are information available to you to help you. And then also just knowing, you know, being available, being willing and able to intervene, and then knowing another component of bystander intervention is if it's not safe for you to intervene, it's okay to enlist help from others. So it's okay to call for backup, so to speak. So we can talk a lot about what, what, you know, what you can do, but I think it's equally important for us to talk about what we can do. And um, that, that's, that's a part which actually I think in, um, right now is just emerging in the media. I think Penn State was a real um, shift. Even though a lot of what was happening in the Catholic Church was going on, especially I live around Boston, that was obviously very big in the news for us. But it really with Penn State, so it was really what the institution's responsibility is. Um, so you think about when you go back to your communities, um, you, you may be involved, at, um, if you have kids with a sports league or little league, or um, maybe involved with a Y. Um, in your communities, you might be involved in a faith community, or you may have a very strong neighborhood um, connection. But you can make a difference in terms of setting a, a new uh, social norm about how to behave. Um, simply by um, going to the bus stop. And um, when, when somebody brings us, you know, the picture of the sex offender just moved down the street and everybody in our bus stop should know about this, it's a great opportunity to begin to talk about that and say, how do we as a neighborhood respond? Um, so going back um, to an organization and thinking about, what are the, asking them, for example, what are the screening policies that, um, that the organization may have? Um, do you have a code of conduct? What kind of training do you give around the code of conduct? And then how do you, how do you um, enforce that? And um, actually, it was actually Marcus Aruga who's standing here, who um, I heard a talk a, lot, a couple years ago, who mentioned offhand that they had been talking to some offenders. And um, one offender at least had talked about how he had sexually abused within one organization, and then not abused in the next organization, and abused again. And asked, what was different about that second organization? And I've had a chance to talk to a number of other offenders about that as well. And they say that it wasn't safe for them to abuse in that second organization. That second organization had created some social norms. Um, to make sure that, that, in fact, that they knew that if they started to stretch the, um, how they interacted with kids, that, um, that s the supervisor would say, oh, I'm not sure if you were familiar with their policy, but you're not allowed to actually close the door. You're not allowed to take the, your, this child um, home on your own. They realized it wasn't safe for them to abuse. So you can create, that's a very, I think, very vivid way of saying that you can create those kinds of social norms. Um, there's a wonderful um, report that, um, that you, is free that was done by the CDC um, about 10 years ago. And um, you can get this online if you just um, Google uh, preventing child sexual abuse within youth serving organizations. If you just do 
CDC, Center for Disease Control, Youth Serving Organizations, this will pop up. Um, it's a great resource. It gives you very concrete examples about what you can do. Um, there's also, I just want to mention, especially since he's in the back of the room and he tends to embarrass me all the time, um, Keith Kaufman is in, the, <laughs> is in the back and is doing some wonderful um, research around situational prevention. Um, and really looking at, really seeing some, um, some, um, some, I think, really incredible results that, that show that actually when an organization invests in prevention, that their, um, their organization is safer. It, and as I think the, the offender said, it's not safe for people to, um, to abuse there. So um, I think one of the things just that these are very, in some ways, it's, I mean, it sounds almost um, overwhelming, but some of these are very simple things that you can do. Um, one of my favorite examples um, is uh, Steve Brown, who uh, works at Klingberg. And um, he created a very inexpensive video just with a webcam and he, you know, that everybody who applies for a job at Klingberg has to watch. And it's this great thing about how great Klingberg is and said how they care deeply about kids. These are at-risk kids and how, how important attachment and connection is. And then about 30 seconds before the end, he goes, however, and let me be perfectly frank here. He said, if you are here to harm in any, one of our children and sexually harm one of our children in any way, we ask that you do not apply for a job here. If you do apply, I want you to know that our organization will, will, will actually will prosecute to the full extent of the law. We ask you to withdraw your application and you seek help. It's very powerful. It takes 30 seconds and every applicant. It's a wonderful statement that, that it's a no cost statement that really says very clearly that this is an organization who understands what the sexual abuse is and will do everything in its power to make sure that, that the, the people in their care, the children in their care are um, being protected. So I want to say, please, you know, if you can, take an active role. Um, be the pebble that starts that ripple, so we can keep that metaphor keep going. Um, and just to say, it's OK to talk about this. Um, if you know that, um, if, and if you do feel comfortable talking about it, make sure you know what to do if someone comes and discloses to you. And help to create the social norms um, that you will respond to all behaviors, um, be it healthy behaviors, as we talked about earlier, unhealthy behaviors, or problematic behaviors, or, or abusive behaviors. So just in closing real quick, uh, we just ask you that you take what you learned tonight and use it in your daily lives. Be askable. We all have a role to play. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Joan or Tracy? Mm -hmm. You can still ask it, Paige. <laughs> So I'm a mom, and um, I'm a filmmaker with my crew here, and I have a really big mouth, so I have no problem <laughs> standing up for things that I think are wrong. But I went to a school in the South where um, many boys were molested by a beloved coach. And what I can't figure out is why nobody stood up for us. Nobody stood up for all the children who were victimized or just in the realm of victimization. I think this idea of bystander intervention is incredible. I think it's important. But why do people tend to not do this? Why, I'm curious, why don't people stand up for children? And why, do we, and why do we, in essence, serve our children on platters to these people when doing that? I think a little bit of it is people don't know what to do. Um, uh, last March, I um, was in the courtroom for the Steubenville, Ohio rape trial. And that was where two football students were found delinquent for, for raping a 16-year-old um, girl. And many of their peers took the stand and gave their testimony. And they said, you know what, something I, I witnessed there, I knew it wasn't right, but I just didn't know what to do. People are afraid to speak out. Um, you know, so through that, in their own words, they were like, they knew something was wrong, they didn't know what to do. Um, so it was mentioned earlier, too, that we need, to, we need to get to the young people, and we need to talk to them and have, you know, honest, honest conversations about boundaries and respect and consent and what that all looks like. Um, and then, too, like with the Jerry Sandusky case, uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center was very active in that as well. And we teamed up with um, the State Sexual Assault Coalition to cover that as well, and I was in the courtroom for that. And I think there's just, um, there's still some disbelief. People don't trust their guts. Um, several people took the stand, and they testified that oh, it's Jerry Sandusky. He did so many good things for our community. He has a charity for crying out loud 
for disadvantaged children. He could never do this. Um, there was a coach at the school uh, that walked in um, on him and another student, and he even said, you know, I left that night, and, I, and it just didn't seem right, but as I was driving home, I just kind of brushed it off as, not nah, Jerry Sandusky, he would never do that. So there's definitely a need for education there. Joan, do you want to? Yeah, um, I also say I think things have changed, um, and things are changing in a really dramatic way. Um, I mean, the best example I can say is that uh, I work um, part-time with a, a, a small press, near, um, and one of the things I wanted to do was have a, uh, was a, book for, a workbook for girls who, um, and, um, who had been sexually abused, and I wanted to have a young voice reading a book as a sample, and so I had my daughter do it. So it was on her computer, she read it for me, I took a part that wasn't very graphic. Then one of her friends came over and they were playing on Facebook on the computer, um, and she saw this, this text. And so she just turned, this, um, the seventh grade just turned to the other, you know, one seventh grader talking to another seventh grader, said, wow, were you sexually abused? I mean, the, 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 the fact that we're talking about this is in the media, the conversations are really changing. Um, and I think that we really have an opportunity here to build on those conversations in a way that we didn't have um, 10 years ago, we didn't have 20 years ago for sure. Um, when, I, when I was in college, you know, they, they actually, my professor said um, in basic psychology that child sexual abuse is the last taboo, it doesn't happen. I, I can't imagine what that felt like for every, every person in that room who had been sexually abused. So we have begun to shift that, you know, so the cultural norm, we have to shift it much further, um, but those opportunities um, exist, and I think that people are taking advantage of them more and more, and we can, we can lead the way there. We are seeing that the tide is turning slowly, but we're very, very hopeful. Are there other questions for? Thank you for your question. Great question. We're going to do a handoff in the middle of the room. <laughs> what do you think is the role of general sex education in the prevention of sexual offending? With an emphasis on the do's and the do and the don'ts. Well, I think first of all, I think that you know the um, that there was um, very few um, evidence-based programs um, that uh, um, have shown around prevention that really have demonstrated to have an effect. And one of them is a program called Safe Dates um, that the CDC has evaluated. Um, Basically, what it has shown is that when kids can talk about um, and, and around sexual, around um, healthy relationships, when they talk about sexual relationships, when they can actually have those conversations, and they have those conversations at an early age, it can make a huge difference um, in their trajectory. So we often start thinking about what needs to happen on college campuses today, and absolutely those conversations are important. But we need to begin those conversations um, when they're younger, and when. I often get the, the question, like, when you do start talking about child sexual abuse with your child, um, I would say you talk about when they're born. You start using the proper name for body parts. Um, that begins the conversation. It gives a language um, to what, at least in my generation, was unspeakable. Um, so if we can talk about healthy sexuality, we can also then begin to talk about what's problematic and then what's, um, and, and then what's abusive. And uh, I often use in my workshops to talk about uh, uh, green light behaviors, yellow light behaviors, and red light behaviors. And if we start waiting until we see abuse, the red light behaviors, we'll never have the conversation. So we need to learn how to talk about the green light behaviors so we can begin to say, that's stretching into yellow light, um, so that we can actually have those conversations before any child is harmed, before anybody is harmed in the family. Do you want to add to that? Or? OK. <laughs> any other questions? Um, hi, I'm one of the filmmakers. Uh, so private institutions are somewhat self-regulated with regards to child sex abuse prevention and complicity. How can the Department of Justice and the government help to change laws for a national standard of care? Oh. <laughs> That's an easy one to try That's and answer. Great question. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, I feel like uh, um, there's like so many people in the room who would have great answers to that. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll just, you know, to start. Um, I, I mean, first and foremost, I think that you know that what uh, President Obama is doing by bringing, you know, by using his uh, position as President of the United States to bring the conversation forward um, is sort of one example um, of, of how our government can make a huge difference. Um, I think the fact that we are not um, investing in prevention, as uh, James, I think, really, as, as Americans, as James really are, um, articulated so well, 
um, we need to begin to start investing in prevention and make that um, as, as valid a choice um, as we are in terms of um, playing on people's fears, which is what I think really drives a lot of what um, is happening in the criminal justice system. Um, I, think that, I think that people are beginning to see that you can't arrest. Um, just as I think um, I couldn't think of a better metaphor than I think what Tom, you did, um, in terms of breaking apart all the ways that we do. But I think that um, we went from, in, you know, in the 70s and 80s, from having really having no conversation, no awareness, um, to, to, to survivors starting to talk about sexual abuse. And at that point, there were federal government funding for programs in schools. But in the 90s, we started talking about offenders as well. And people's fears just ratcheted up. And it's almost like the pendulum swung, swung, swung the whole other, the opposite direction. Um, and I think that it's time as we begin to swing. And, and that's where we have all the punitive laws that Tom articulated so well. I think that people realize that you can't punish our ways out of the situation. We can't stop sexual violence um, through punishment. And it's a key piece of it. We can't throw away all those sticks. But it's time to move back towards the middle and start thinking about what we can do about investing in prevention. Um, we're not there yet, but I think that there are some opportunities that I'm hoping um, that the, the government, and particularly the Department of Justice, will begin to start taking advantage of. And then, too, it was mentioned earlier how the majority of the media reports, they cover this topic in the criminal justice lens. So I think just, again, changing those cultural norms, um, working with reporters, because they kind of set the narrative. That's where people are getting their information from, is from the media. So if the media can expand it and not only talk about the crimes that are happening, but talk about prevention, talk about survivors, talk about services, um, talk about engaging bystanders. And I think what Joan said about the White House and their initiatives, it's turning, um, you know, slowly but surely. And they put us on last because we're optimists. <laughs> no, we put you on last because you're a voice of power. <laughs> Are there other questions for um, Joan and Tracy? Well, thank you very much. I think we'll conclude the event at this time. <laughs> We thank you very much for your attendance. Again, there's a number of resources in the back. Please take advantage of those. Um, thank you very much to all of our wonderful speakers, as well as our co-sponsors for the event, CalCASA, COSO, IVAT, and NSVRC. And have a wonderful evening, everyone.